Welcome. Um, so this is going to be a lecture on poetry. So I'm going to discuss poetry in general. And then we will um, specifically look at three poems, uh, a Shakespeare sonnet, um, Milton's On His Blindness, and William Wordsworth, London, 1802. So let's begin, first of all, with the definition of poetry. There is no one definition of poetry, um, but I, I'm going to define poetry for you in, a, in several different ways. And uh, feel free, I've created, by the way, a new discussion thread on Canvas, um, which includes genre, colon, poetry. So feel free to add your own understanding of what poetry means. I will begin with a couple of different standard definitions of poetry. Um, William Wordsworth, who's one of the poets that we are going to read, defined poetry this way. Poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its origin from emotions recollected in tranquility. And this last part has been quoted very often. Poetry is emotion recollected in tranquility. And so while poetry certainly is an overflow of powerful feelings, it is nevertheless uh, emotions that have been corralled, that have been harnessed using the power of words in order to convey them. So yes, powerful feelings, yes. Overflow, yes, but not overflow in terms of out of control, but rather because poetry is recollected in tranquility, poetry is very, very measured speech. It is far more measured than uh, you would find in any other genre of literature. Um, that's one definition of poetry. Another, poet, another definition of poetry uh, is the idea that poetry is compressed speech. Um, and by compressed speech, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that poetry says less, but rather it says more, but it says it in fewer words. In other words, poetry is the most economic uh, mode of harnessing the power of language. So if we think of the novel, uh, and the novel working uh, with literature at the level of the chapter, and we think of the short story, which is working with literature at the level of the page, or sometimes even of the paragraph. A poem is literature which works at the level of the, the sentence, and sometimes even at the level of the word, okay? So all of these things are different units, different ways of harnessing the power of language. You can harness language in a chapter, you can harness it on a page or even in a paragraph, but poetry specifically, because it is the most economic mode of har harnessing the power of language, it looks at the power of the word, uh, both on an individual level, but also at the level of the sentence. And we know that sentence, of course, is kind of a misnomer because sentences are actually, sentences belong, right? Sentences belong to this genre, right? A sentence belongs to the genre of the short story or to the novel. Um, um, but for a poem, although you can have, certainly, you can certainly have dramatic poetry, you can have poems that are written in sentences, but, but the unit at which poetry harnesses the power of language is at the unit of the verse, right? Uh, so what's the difference, right? What's the difference uh, between a sentence and a verse. Um, well, there's one important difference, right? Uh, and the important difference is that a sentence usually, a sentence usually um, depends on the coordination of subjects, verbs, and objects, right? In order to create meaning, right? Uh, and so the ordering of a sentence is always Subject followed by verb followed by object, right? Uh, but poetry and verse here uh, eh, does not necessarily conform, necessarily conform to the rhetoric, uh, uh, does not necessarily form to the grammar and syntax, I should say, of the sentence. Um, Although it might, right? Although it might. Um, and so uh, a verse in a poem 
may have the verb followed by the subject, followed by the object. It may have the verb followed by the description, followed by the subject, followed by more description, followed by the object. It may have the object, it may have description, it may have a verb, it may have more description, and then it may have the subject. In other words, the ordering that we normally expect of subject verb object in a sentence, a verse does not necessarily conform to that ordering. That's what we mean by the syntax. Uh, it does not necessarily conform. And so keep this in mind. A poetry uses the power of the mind to understand in images and in figurations rather than in exposition. So in other words, the human brain is capable of understanding uh, through exposition, right, through subject verb object, that's exposition, but the human mind is also capable of understanding things in terms of images. The human mind is also capable of understanding things in terms of figurative language rather than literal language. And so because, because the brain, because the brain understands language in multiple ways, so too does poetry try to express the workings of the brain and of the emotion in different ways, in the different ways that language allows, uh, and in the different ways in which the mind can comprehend language. And so poetry uses certain devices that are unique to it, and, and without going into a lot of detail, we're going to discuss a couple of those devices today. And so simile and metaphor, you've studied these in high school, no doubt. You know that simile is a poetic device um, that compares things using like or as, right? She was as beautiful as the sun. Uh, he smelled like a unwashed sock. Uh, these are all poetic devices uh, that, that make comparison between things. And of course, what's the power of simile? The power of simile is that um, the power of simile comes from the fact that um, the associations with the thing that are ostensibly unlike what you're interested in allow you to understand what interests you in a more profound way. In other words, the comparison, the ways in which the thing that you're comparing uh, is unlike the thing that you are comparing it to allows you to understand the original thing in a more profound way. Uh, metaphor is very, very similar to poetry. It is the companion to poetry. However, it's a device that compares things without using like or as, right? Um, so I'll give you an example of a metaphor. Um, and again, feel free to comment on this uh, in, in, the, in the discussion board thread if you like. Here's an example of a metaphor that I, that I love to share with students. Um, and again, it, it's metaphors and similes both work on the same principle, that the thing that you are comparing is unlike what you're really interested in. However, it allows you to understand what, what interests you in a more profound way, right? Uh, using um, using um, qualities that aren't, um, that, using qualities uh, uh, that aren't, um, that aren't latent, in the object of interest, but nevertheless powerful for understanding it. The best way is to show you three example. I can talk about this and confuse you, or I can give you an example. Here's an example of a metaphor. Forgiveness is the fragrance on the heel of the shoe that has washed. That's an example of metaphor. Forgiveness is the fragrance uh, of the flower on the heel of the shoe that has crushed it. Forgiveness 
is the fragrance of the flower on the heel of the shoe that has crushed it. Um, feel free, right, to uh, comment on how this metaphor works. Uh, uh, and again, I invite you to do that and do exactly that uh, in um, the discussion board thread on the genre of poetry. Um, anyway, let me, uh, let's take a look at these two devices uh, in action and let's look at Shakespeare's uh, sonnet number 73. And um, uh, this is gonna be a, a recording that again, as I said, includes all three works of poetry. Feel free to pause um, after each of the different poems that I discuss and answer the questions that I've given to you. Uh, so um, the lecture that I'm gonna give you should help you to answer those questions. So let's begin with sonnet number 73, shall we? Um, let me put a break in here so that uh, we have it all on one page. So um, sonnet 73. We talked about Shakespeare's poetry, or perhaps we didn't talk about it. Um, one of the ways that poetry works is, as I said, it works at the level of the uh, it works at the level of the word, and certain qualities of words allow for meaning uh, uh, to emerge, right? And two qualities of words that allow for meaning to emerge are rhyme and rhythm, right? And so um, these are two important things to keep note of as you're reading poetry. So rhyme, right? Rhyme, we know what rhyme is, right? Rhyme um, is the similar sounds between words and rhythm is the cadence of spoken words, right? And both of these things, right? Both rhythm and rhyme depend upon spoken words, right? They appeal to the ear, right? Poetry is meant for the ear rather than for the eye. That's one of the ways in which poetry is different from drama, right? Drama is meant for the eye uh, as well as the ear. Poetry is meant for the ear and sometimes for the eye as well. Um, so remember, rhyme is the similar sounds between words and rhythm is the cadence of spoken words, right? The different beats in a word or in a verse. So take a look at the rhyme scheme of a Shakespeare poem. That time of year, thou mayest in me behold, when yellow leaves are done or few do hang, upon these bow upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. Notice how this line ends with the behold sound. This line ends with the hang sound. This line ends with the cold sound. And this line ends with the sang sound. And notice that there is rhyme, but there isn't rhyme from one line to the next. There's alternating lines of rhyme, right? So if we were to call the word behold the A rhyme, then the hang would be a B rhyme, right? And notice that the behold rhymes with cold, and so we would have another A rhyme in line three, and the sang rhymes with hang, and so we'd have a B rhyme in line four. And Shakespeare has a tendency in writing his sonnets, uh, these are poems of 14 lines, with alternating rhyme schemes. Okay, so Shakespeare's poems are A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, right, we notice Day rhymes with away, West rhymes with rest. So A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F. Why? Because uh, fire and expire and lie and buy. And lastly, the last two lines, strong and long, are both G, G rhymes. So 14 lines with alternating rhyme schemes in units of four. So here's one set of rhymes, the ABAB -A -B rhyme, and then here's another set of rhymes, the CDCD -D rhyme, here's a third set of rhymes, the EFEF -E rhymes, and then we've got the GG rhymes. And so these are units. The poem is actually broken down into units by rhyme scheme. Uh, so alternating rhymes in units of four. Units of four are called quatrains in poetry, right? And so Shakespeare's poem is composed of three quatrains. Why? Because we've got a unit of four over here. That's one quatrain. Here's another quatrain. Here's a third quatrain. 
And then when we have the GG at the end, that is known as a couplet. Three quatrains plus one couplet. I remember a couplet is just two rhymes uh, that that are that that rhyme next to one another. So strong and long rhyme with one another. So rhythm rhyme is one way to look at poetry, and rhythm is another way. So rhythm is another thing um, that we want, may want to pay attention to. That time of year when that time of year thou mayst in me behold when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold their ruined choirs where late the sweet bird sang in me thou seest the twilight of such day as after sunset fadeth in the west which by and by black night doth take away that sect in self that seals up all in rest. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie as, as the deathbed whereon it must expire, consumed by that which it was nourished by. This thou perceivest which makes thy love more strong to love that well which to love that well which thou must leave ere long. And you'll notice that there is a rhythmic regularity, right? There is a rhythmic regularity uh, within Shakespeare's lines. Not all poetry has this kind of rhythmic regularity, but in Shakespeare's sonnets, this regularity, you, I'm sure, are familiar with this expression of iambic pentameter. And what that means, basically, is that these are, these are units, uh, an iamb, uh, let me describe what an iamb is, I am is a unit of rhythm composed of a an unstressed followed by a stressed syllable. And so what does that mean? That time, right? And when you say this sentence, when you read this verse aloud, where do you, the stress is where you are emphasizing certain words. So this line would be read as, that time of year thou mayst in me behold. Bup, 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 bup. Every time you hear that, that stress syllable, so this would be an unstressed syllable, just to give you a little bit of a scansion over here. Um, so that would be unstressed and then time would be stressed, and of would be unstressed, and then year would be stressed, and then thou would be unstressed, and then mayest would be stressed, and in would be unstressed, and me would be stressed, and then the, for the be of behold would be unstressed, and the whole would be stressed. So unstressed, that, Time, the emphasis here is on time. Of year, the emphasis is on a year. Thou mayest, emphasis on mayest. In me, behold. So notice, we have uh, units of unstressed followed by stressed syllables. Here is your unstressed followed by stressed. That is one I am, right? Every one of these combinations is one I am. So here is one I am. Here is another. Here is another another and here's another and so there are five I am's and the reason why it's called iambic pentameter is because there are five I am's per verse per line iambic because it's unstressed followed by stress and pentameter because there's one two three four five penta pentameter so again these are good things to know as you're paying attention to poetry but anyway I want to give you just some sense of what's going on in each quatrain and this will help you to understand the questions that I've actually assigned for you to think about. So let's take a look at the first quatrain, and let's take a look at some of the similar um, similar uh, sort of trends that show up. So let's just look, look at these first two, first four quatrains. Again, we're going to consider this to be a unit because, of, because the rhyme scheme tells us that it's a unit. That time of year thou mayest in me behold, when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold, their ruined choirs were late the sweet birds sang. And so what's he doing? He's, he's asking the person who he's speaking to, uh, the person who's beholding him, 
to notice that there's a time of year in him. It's not the time of year, it's, it's not the time of year that we would normally expect to find on a clock or on a calendar, but it's a time of year that's found in me, in me. And so there are two different units of time that are being discussed, right? There's the time that we're used to seeing, right? Measured time. Uh, and then there's also the time of year that is found in him. And here, it's not just measured time, that it's also human time as well, right? Um, so you can measure uh, a week. A week is the same for you or for me or for somebody who lives in a different country or in a different state. That measured time is the same for everybody. But for human time, uh, uh, everyone has, everyone operates according to his or her own human time, right? I may be, I may be, you know, in the in the, in the last last moments of my time here on earth, you may be in the first moments of your time here. So everyone has their own scale of time. In human time, we all operate according to our own scale, but in measured time, we're, we're, we're both operating from the same day. We're both on April 6th right now, right? But in human time, this may mean the end of my days. April 6th may be the end of my days. It may be the beginning of yours. So again, he wants to, Shakespeare wants to alert us to different ways in which time can be measured. A human time as opposed to calendrical time or diurnal time. In this case, the, kind, the measure of time that's being taken is seasonal time, right? And we know that it is seasonal time. Why? Because what's happening in the second line? When yellow leaves or none or few do hang. At what time of the year are there none or few or yellowed leaves hanging? And so the yellow leaves or none or few that do hang give a sense that the time of year, the seasonal time of the year that Shakespeare is alerting us to is fall, right? Uh, fall into winter. Uh, and the winter hasn't quite arrived yet, but there's very few leaves or very yellowed leaves or, very, or no leaves at all that do hang where that do hang in him we know what it we, we know what it means to have yellow leaves hanging on a tree but what does it mean when yellow leaves hang on a person right uh, here the word leaves is being used metaphorically right leaves for a tree we know exactly what a leaf is but if a person is in the fall of his life and he's got yellowed leaves or very few yellowed leaves that do hang, what can we say? We can say that when a person's in the fall of their life, where very few leaves do hang upon them, um, uh, we may compare this to uh, hair, right? Uh, someone with blonde hair may be compared, and someone who maybe perhaps has um, uh, someone who is balding with blonde hair may be compared to somebody who's in the fall of his life and many of those leaves which normally cover the top of something leaves usually cover the top of a tree right just as hair usually covers the top of a person's head when a person starts to shed his yellow leaves um, he we can say that that person is in the fall of their life upon which upon those boughs which shake against the coal and indeed if a person is in the fall of their life and they're heading towards the cold of their life. Uh, in terms of seasonal time, we talk winter, but in terms of human time, what is the winter of a person's life, right? At what point in a person's life do they end up turning cold? Right? We can figure that out, right? And not only is this person growing old, and not only is he moving from the fall of his life into the winter of it, but here in these lines, bare ruined choirs where late the sweet bird sang, right? Once upon a time, he's comparing his body, right? He's comparing his body to a tree. Uh, he's comparing his human time to fall into winter time, right? Uh, his hair is shedding just as leaves turn yellow and start shedding in the fall. And those boughs that once upon a time had sweet birds singing, right? When do sweet birds sing on a tree? They usually sing in summertime. Once upon a time, sweet, once upon a time, he had his summer also, but now 
he, but now that, that, that fall has come, those sweet birds have flown away. And so, again, if, if his body is being compared to a tree, and here his head is being talked about, upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bare ruined choirs were late, the sweet birds sang. This may be, yet again, another reference to his, his, his face, his head, right? Um, there used to be a, a sign of, of loveliness and sweetness on his face, and now there is bareness and there's ruination. This may refer to his face. It may refer to his hair. But nevertheless, we know that he is, he, I'm assuming it's a he, it could be a woman. There's no indication here of whether it's a man or woman, but we do know that this person is moving into the twilight of their life. So the first quatrain uses seasonal time to note how this person is moving towards death. Notice how the, the theme of time is continued in the second quatrain with slight creation. Uh, here's how the second quatrain begins. In me thou seest the twilight of such day as after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away death's second self that seals up all in rest. And so we go from one measure of time, which is seasonal time, uh, to a different measure of time, right? The time, there's still a measure of time that's being taken in the second quatrain, but now it is daily time. And how do we know that it's daily time and not seasonal time? Well, the word twilight gives us that, right? When do you expect to see twilight? Well, every day, not once in a season. Uh, when do you expect to see a sunset? Well, again, every day. Uh, when do you see uh, the sunset fading in the west? Again, every day. When do you see night coming? Night comes at the end of every day. Uh, and the line eight, which talks about death's second self that seals up all in rest, what do you think the mention is? What 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 happens? What what happens when black night approaches? Uh, what's happening over here? Death's second self. What is death's second self? This is a metaphor, isn't it? Right? Death's second self is a metaphor for what? Well, here's a clue that seals up all in rest. When you think of the word rest, and you think of the word night, when you think of these two words together or next to one another as they appear in these lines. What do you think of? Rest and night. What words come to mind? Well, I would hope that this word comes to mind, right? Uh, and isn't that what is being mentioned over here? Isn't sleep death's second self? In other words, the mention here of death's second self doesn't necessarily mean a doubling of death, but rather something that death looks like. When a person goes to sleep, when you see somebody sleeping at night, what might they look like to you if you thought about it long enough, right? Might it also not look like they were dead, right? And that's what sleep is. Sleep is a kind of a temporary death. It only, you know, it's, it's the kind of death that only lasts for six, seven, eight hours, whatever it is, right? And we know that at the end of it, um, one awakens from death's second self. And so the unit of time that's being talked about over here is daily time. And again, the same kinds of trends that we saw in the first quatrain occur in the second quatrain. This person is in the twilight of his day. Uh, his sunset is fading, right? And, and, and again, this idea of fading, again, suggests this idea of light, right? Which is fading, right? And as light fades, the comparison that's given is that night takes that light away. Night takes away the light of the day. Um, that's how a sunset is described. And again, just as a person goes to sleep at night and that person might look like they're dead, this person, because they're, they're moving towards the winter of their life, they're not just moving towards sleep, right? They're actually moving towards death's first self. They're actually moving towards death. But again, a, a similar set of uh, comparisons in Quatrain 2, again, relating to the relationship between measured time and human time. Let's look at the third Quatrain, which begins um, with, In me, in me, thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie, as the deathbed whereon it must expire, consumed with that which it was nourished by. And so 
a couple of new things are introduced in the third quatrain. In the third quatrain, there is a second character who is introduced. We haven't heard of anyone else in this poem besides the speaker, but now with the word thou, we see a second person in the poem. That's a new development in quatrain number three. Um, and we also see a new image that appears in quatrain three, which did not appear in quatrains one and two, which is this idea of fire, right? That is sort of the predominant image that shows up in the third quatrain. We see fire, we see ashes, and we even see this line, which says, consumed with that which it was nourished by. When you think of a fire and what it is nourished by, what is a fire nourished by? What feeds a fire? Well, a couple of things can feed a fire, right? Wood can feed a fire, uh, coal can feed a fire, right? Anything flammable, right? Whatever it is that is combustible feeds the fire. It nourishes the fire. But notice also what's happening to the fire uh, that burns in him. In, in me thou seest the glowing of such fire. It's not a roaring fire. It's such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie. It's not a blazing, roaring fire. Rather, it's a fire that has turned more into ash than flame, right? So the ratio of ash to flame is very high, right? There's more ash than there is flame uh, as the deathbed whereon it must expire. And again, this word expire allows a comparison between two different things. Well, number one, when a fire is about to burn out, you see that it's literally surrounded by the ashes that it's turning into. Uh, but at the same time, the word expire also relates to human time as well, right? Um, sometimes when a person expires, and let's say if they're cremated, what happens to the person uh, who is cremated? This is not necessarily what Shakespeare is talking about. I mean, but we can think about it one way. Even in Shakespeare's time, people were cremated. Um, when a person expires, right, they, they go back to dust. We know this expression. Any good Christian in Shakespeare's time would have known that man comes from, ash, from ashes to ashes and dust to dust, right? Man comes from dust and he returns to dust. And so Shakespeare is once again going back to this idea of human time. And in this case, he's using the dominant image of fire to, again, point out the fact that this man's fire is about to have its last licks of flame. Um, uh, on the very ashes of the youth it doth lie, right? Once upon a time, this man was young, but now old age seems to be sitting on top of his youth. Uh, and just as a just as a fire expires on the very ashes, right? That um, you know, it, it expires in the very ashes. The very places where wood turns into ashes is the place where the fire expires. A fire is consumed with that which it was nourished by. It was once nourished by the wood, but now the fire has turned that wood into ash. And at some point, the ratio of ash to flame is so high that the ash actually takes over and consumes the fire that once upon a time the fire created. The fire created the ashes, but now there's so much ash that the ash starts to consume the fire. And he's using this to point out the fact that, look, human beings which once had youth to them, um, the very same youth that you're so proud of when you're so young, when you grow old and you're nearing your death, you think to yourself, boy, all these memories of my youth, I'm almost going to be dying with, with, with a recollection of everything that I once was. It's, there's, it's almost like a person, a person who looks back on their life and how young they were and how strong they were and how they once had a full head of hair. They, it's almost like they're consumed by the very thought of youth that they once had, but which now they clearly do not have, right? Uh, so line 12 sort of ends on kind of a down note. Uh, and we expect the poem to end that way as well. But the last two lines of the poem do something very, very interesting. We go back to the thou. This thou perceivest. So everything that the 12 lines have given us have been the perception of the thou, right? The thou that's mentioned over here and then brought up again in line 13. So again, the shift in perspective in quatrain three to the thou 
and then the, and then the move right back again to the thou in the final final couplet. This thou perceivest, which makes thy love more strong. Um, and so you notice how I'm about to grow old. You notice how I'm about to die. And what is the effect of you noticing that I'm about to die? It makes your love stronger, which makes sense, right? If you are worried that that the person who you love is going to die, it makes you feel much, much more strongly about them. It makes you love them more. So this is what we're kind of expecting the poem to end off with, with, with saying that because you, who obviously are not near death, are watching me, who am close to death, about to expire, you start to love me even more. Uh, and then line 14 does something surprising. Just as it looks like the, 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 the person who is being talked about, the person who's going to die, is about to end, the poem ends with this line. This thou perceivest which makes thy love more strong, to love that well which thou must leave ere long. So there's two ways to interpret these lines, right? I'm going to die, and so we are going to be parted from one another, right? We must leave one another ere long, and so therefore your love grows more stronger for me. But the interesting thing here is it's not which I must leave ere long. If it was which I must leave ere long, then the focus would clearly be on the person who's being discussed in the first 12 lines. Shakespeare does a switcheroo on us, and it's really surprising. To love that well which thou must leave ere long, all along, our focus has been on the subject who is worried about his own demise. And again, I use the word his with quotation marks. We don't know if it's a he or a she. Uh, and we don't know if the thou is a he or she either. There is no indication of who, you know, whether there's a man and a woman or two men or two women. We have no indication. But again, just assuming for a second that the speaker is a he. Our focus has been on the subject who's worried about his own demise. And yet the poem ends with the impending demise of the thou. And here's the surprising thing, right? It's the second interpretation of the poem. Well, the first interpretation is that they're about to part, and so thou must love me more strongly. The second interpretation is that although he's been worried about his own demise, it's all been sort of very, very self-centered, through the first 12 lines, the specter of death, which affects people who are fall into winter, nevertheless also affects people who may be spring into summer, right? The very same death that comes for the old also can come for the young as well, right? And all of these kinds of comparisons that are made about, don't forget, death is coming. Look at all these signs that tell you that death is coming. Sometimes... Death can come with a whole bunch of signs forecasted, and sometimes it can just spring up on you, like it does in line 14 of this poem. It springs up out of nowhere, and it claims the people who we never thought of as being vulnerable to death. And so um, Shakespeare makes a very, very interesting use of metaphor in this poem. Um, certainly, um, uh, you know, um, uh, it's something to think about, right? Um, it's a very, very good poem. Um, so I'm going to pause here, and then I'll pick up again uh, with the Milton with, with the Milton poem next.